introducing that new song to us. How fitting. As we grow in the Lord, we long increasingly for the coming of Jesus Christ. I want you to turn your Bibles to, to Mark chapter 7, looking at verses 1 to 13 today. As you're turning there, let me mention a couple of things I did not mention earlier. We Next Sunday is the first Sunday of the month. It's Easter Sunday as well. We will have our Lord's Supper celebration here. We will not have a fellowship meal together after that, however, giving you opportunity to be with your, with your extended families. We will not have life groups that evening either. So that's a change you can start thinking about right now. The Lord's Supper, uh, Easter Sunday, uh, no fellowship meal, uh, no life groups that evening. In Mark chapter 7, we just come out of a section where Jesus has been swarmed and swamped with people just wanting to touch the hem of his garment in, in the area of the Gerasenes and in hopes that they would be healed and told that all who did were. And so as best we can put together the chronology of Jesus' life, he moves from that place to Capernaum and is probably about a year away from the crucifixion at this point. He's a year away from the Palm Sunday event that recognized him temporarily and said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the, that's the language of the Old Testament that identifies Messiah. But I want you to look in Mark 7 with me this morning, 1 to 13. I hope you have your Bibles and have them turn to that. If you don't, we've got the text on the screen. Simply ask you to stand with me momentarily. Let's stand a moment while I read this text. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from, the, from me is carbon, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. Not a kind word for the scribes and the Pharisees, the lawyers and the religious leaders. And it's these kind of things that would push the issue and lead them to decide the only thing they could do was to have him crucified by the Roman government. Let's take heed today, folks. Let's learn from this. We've just read what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May this sink into us. May we be taught by it. May the gospel come out of it. And we be delivered from the bondage of tradition that it can bind us to the liberty of the gospel. Thank you. Be seated. You know, when you read the account of Palm Sunday later on in the Gospels, there's, the hatred is intensifying. The people are crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And, and they're doing all these acts of obeisance to him. And, and the Pharisees are just, their blood is boiling. Tell the people to be quiet, he said. Tell this rabble to shut up. It just intensifies. From here on out, pretty much anything the Pharisees say or do, Jesus exposes them. 
And it's these kind of things that we read today that, that helped build up to that intense hatred, Palm Sunday. I want us to just look at this text for a few minutes. Three, the text for two things and then just draw some things out of it for a third issue. The Pharisees accused Jesus and his disciples. That's, we see that coming out. Secondly, Jesus answers their accusation with one of his own. Finally, the age-old battle between tradition and God's word. Let's unpack this here. These, are, these Pharisees accuse Jesus and his disciples in verses 1 to 5. They were gathered to him. We think he's at Capernaum at this point. He's moved from the, the garrison area, the Gennesaret, moved to, to Capernaum. They meet him there. They've come from Jerusalem. They're sent on a mission. The fact that they have the scribes with them should make our antenna pop up. It would be like saying, uh, Pastor Bill wants to meet with us and he has his attorney. That'd be unusual. That's what you have going on here. They brought the attorneys with them. So it's clearly to observe him and see what they can find to accuse him of. And in, in Luke's gospel, there's a, there's a section that says they were appalled that even he did not wash his hands before he ate. So what's going on here? Well, what they're drawing from the ceremonial law, the, the need of, of ceremonial washings that the priests had, were required to go through and the people were taught by them. I used to have a cartoon and I couldn't find it in my files, but it's, you, you're familiar with the Frank and Ernest cartoon series? There was one that came out years ago and you've got Frank and Ernest, one of them standing there sort of dressed up in a mosaic fashion. He's holding the two tablets of the law, the Ten Commandments, and there's a stack of tablets over over here. And the caption is, these are the Ten Commandments. Those are the government regulations regarding the Ten Commandments. Well, that's the, what the Pharisees did. From the Ten Commandments, the moral law, <laughs> they developed like 613 commandments. A certain portion of those were prohibitions, don't do this, that, the other. Others were, were admonitions, do this. So what's happening behind this is there were ceremonial cleansings taught, but folks, and I'm not going to go back through what I preached probably seven years ago now, seven or eight years ago, on the moral law, but the Ten Commandments is the moral law of God in a summary fashion. Every evangelical commandment in the New Testament that you read comes from one or more of the Ten Commandments. But you see, the law, the law manifested itself in Old Testament times in three different distinct categories. One was moral law, which was to be carried through. The moral law reflects the perfect life of Jesus and calls us to, to live a life of obedience. The ceremonial law, which, which had the effect of separating Israel from the rest of the nations with certain washings and cleansings and, and, and ceremony. The, 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 the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, was not commonly celebrated by the pagan nations. It was a distinctly Jewish thing. The ceremonial law separated the people as to keep them relatively clean, ethnically speaking. There was a judicial law that, that ordered their life in a way that, again, made them distinct from the other nations of the world. In Jesus Christ, when he comes, he fulfills all the law. He fulfills the ceremonial law. Peter ta got taught that in Acts, didn't he? He's sleeping up on the roof, goes into a trance, a dream. As the sheet drops down with all these animals that in the Old Testament, ceremonial law, the Jew was forbidden to eat. You bump into people today who won't eat shellfish because of, of the prohibition against it in the Old Testament. I, for one, being from southeast Texas near Galveston, I'm thrilled that the ceremonial law is eclipsed. I love shrimp. I love crawfish. I love lobster when I watch other people eat it. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a prohibition. The sheet is dropped before Peter. Take, eat. Peter says, I'll never eat anything unclean. And the voice comes from heaven, don't call anything I've made unclean. Jesus eclipses the ceremonial law. Here's the, here's the dilemma here. They see him breaking the law rather than see him as the, as the perfect law keeper. Rather than being willing to learn from him what it means to honor the law. So there's their controversy. Why do your disciples not walk according 
to the tradition of the elders. Very interesting language there. Because they have mixed law and tradition. So much so that tradition has eclipsed the simplicity of the law. Tradition has eclipsed the purpose of the law. And Mark describes this. He gives a couple of just further words of explanation to tell us that the audience reading this was not exclusively Jewish. He, he kind of lets them in on it. Just look at verse 2. They saw some of the disciples ate with hands that were defiled. That is unwashed. So he explains what defiled means. They're unwashed. They hadn't had the ceremonial washing. And then he gives this parenthesis here. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat. It's kind of become commonplace. That you're, if you've been in the marketplace, who knows? I mean, you may have touched something that a Gentile touched. You, you may have passed under the shadow of a Gentile. God forbid. And so when you come back, you would wash yourself so you'd be ceremonially clean and not stained by Gentile defilement. So they ask, why do they do this? Why do your disciples? And Luke adds, and they were appalled that he, even he didn't wash his hands. So this group, the scribes and the Pharisees, have come to spy on him to observe something that they can accuse him of. In their minds, he's playing fast and loose with the law. He cannot be a rabbi. He cannot be a man sent from God because he does not regard the law. And for them, the law was almost swallowed up in their traditions. Well, secondly, we see Jesus answering their charge with a charge of his own. He said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? It's the only time in Mark's gospel that Jesus calls the Pharisees and scribes, hypocrites. Hypocrates is the, is the literal Greek word there. Hypo, uh, krates, wearing a mask. The actors of the day on the, on the Greek stage were hypocrites. Hypocrates. They, they wore the big mask. The, the, dramedy, the, the drama and the tragedy had the, had the big frown on the mask. The, the comedies had the big smile on the masks. Well did Isaiah prophesy. Now he's not that when Isaiah said this in Isaiah 29, he was speaking specifically of this group of Pharisees. He's simply saying, Isaiah prophesied about people like you. Hypocrites like you. Because see, what we're pointing out is, your, your mouth, if all we go by is your mouth, you, no one knew the law better than the Pharisees and the scribes. People were envious of the scribes and the Pharisees. If I could only know the law like they do. Jesus said, your law keeping is only lip service. It's not done from a heart. And see, that's the point of the law, folks. That's the point of the Ten Commandments. It's to press upon you and me. I cannot keep this on my own. No matter how hard I try, I cannot. They had decided they could. They just simply rewrote it somewhat to fit what they were doing. They reduced it in some areas. Then they intensified it in others for things that they, could, they uniquely could do, but the common people could not do. And they used it as a, as, a, as a chain upon the common people. Hypocrites, he says. Your words honor me. Your heart's far from me. Oh, dear God. May not any of us here who profess to know Christ, may that not be true of any of us here. He says their worship is vain. Because they make key doctrines out of, the, out of men's. Now, the, now, they said traditions. They don't keep the traditions of the elders. Jesus said, you have come up with your own commandments. The commandments of men. And you read that and you go, dear God, do I, do I have any man-made commandments that, that in my mind, thou shalt and thou shalt not, that I superimpose upon other people to make me think that they're not as spiritual as they ought to be? 
You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And then it's, it's verse 9, in, if you read in the Greek, how beautiful you reject the commandment of God. How beautifully you do this. Well, in other words, he said it's a great, it's a lovely deception. So the ESV says you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. Here's his accusation. Not only that they are hypocrites, <clears throat> not only that they have let their traditions become commandments and, and superimpose them upon the commandments of God so that the commandments of God are almost lost to the view of people. For Moses said, verse 10, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. That's from uh, Exodus 20, 12, of course. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. The next is 20, 17 and Leviticus 20, verse 9, give us these, these two warnings that whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. They would take a child, by the way, in the, in the days of, of Moses, a child who was growing up to be a rebel. And we don't know how old, if there was an age limit here, but they would, on occasion, they would take a child to the elders of the city and say, we cannot control this child. We have exhorted, we have admonished, we have pled, we have begged, we have prayed, and this child is, is out of, just out of control. Will you handle him? And if they handed their child over to the elders, the prescription was, take the child outside the city gates, round up the community, particularly bring your children, and they would stone this child to death. That others may hear and fear. Whoever reviles father and mother shall be put to death. But you say, verse 11, if a man tells his father or his mother whatever you would have gained from me, because there was a responsibility under the law for the children to take care of their aging parents. I was, Karen and I were in a meeting recently and our sons were there as well and the, and the speaker asked, do any of you have elderly parents? And my sons raised their hands. That was quite shocking to me. <laughs> but, I get back at him because see what the scripture says is that if you have elderly parents, you're supposed to take care of them. So here's what the Pharisees did. They brokered a deal among themselves and the more well-to-do people. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother whatever you would have gained from me because you know that I have responsibility to care for you and I would love to care for you, but... I have already made a commitment to the synagogue. It's Corbin. I have pledged to give this gift, this Corbin, to the synagogue. Well, I mean, folks, it's a, it's a laundry scheme. If Pharisees are doing that, their wages are coming from the synagogue. So their gift is going. And they can draw it out. That is given to God. Now, then you no longer watch. It's not that they, they simply allow it. Then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother. The Corban, the, the commitment to the gift is that this, you may give to the synagogue, but you may not freely stop and say, well, I need to help my parents. No, you've, you have pledged Corban. They did the exact opposite of the law. Thus making void the word of God by your tradition. that you've handed down. And many such things you do. So it's not the only place where you're hypocrites. There are many areas where you're hypocrites. Now Jesus' response is scathing to them. Let's think just for a few minutes about this age-old battle between tradition and God's Word. Not all tradition is bad, by the way. First, if, if we have a tradition here that we stand when we read the Word of God, we read the Word of God responsibly in the, in the course of our service, uh, those are good things. So not, this is not a trampling under of tradition. 
It's a challenge to make sure that tradition flows out of and is compatible with the Word of God. That we don't make up our own thou shalt and thou shalt not. And there's a thousand of those. But rather than try to run down that list today, I want us to, to think about something. Let's look at this through the gospel lenses. If you nullify the law, if you, if you abrogate the law, if you, if you swallow it up with, with traditions and, and make, the, make the, the life of the church the do's and don'ts of some group, typically fundamentalists do this, by the way, with a capital F. You know, your, your hair needs to be a certain length. Uh, I read a fellow one time, I don't think, I hope this isn't preventing, he said, you know, you better be suspicious of a fellow with facial hair. Jesus had facial hair, for crying out loud. Some of these made-up rules. You know, when I was growing up, one of the little funny things we said was, I don't, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't cuss, I don't chew, and I don't run around with women who do. It's some of those things you shouldn't do, by the way. Certainly shouldn't cuss. <laughs> But these superimposing things that we think become the standard of right and wrong, we, gotta, we all have to check that and make sure that what we think is submitting itself to the Word of God. Because see, the moral law was given, and Paul teaches this in Galatians, it was never given believing that a mere human being could keep it. It was given to show us and convince us we can't keep it. And so if the Pharisees were monkeying with the law so that it looked like to the people that they were able to keep it, the, the Pharisees were, but the people were not, it totally, totally obliterates the meaning of the law and the use of the law. If we're not careful, people will miss the gospel because they'll be caught up in, in some man-made list of do's and don'ts. One of the worst things we can tell a sinner is, Get your life together and you can join with us. That's hypocritical because none of us have our lives together. Even since the entrance of the gospel, we're still a mess in many ways. But the law was given to convince us we cannot keep it. And Jesus sees what the Pharisees have done. It's incredibly hypocritical and very dangerous because they will block out people from even seeing what coming into the kingdom means. Because you see, God the lawgiver sent Jesus Christ the law keeper to die for law breakers. These Pharisees, their guilt was that they were accusing Jesus of being a law breaker. And that would undermine the impression of the people. That's how they could go from on Sunday Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to Good Friday, crucify, crucify. Because the, the law of God was not in view to be pressed upon them as it must be pressed upon us, upon our children, our grandchildren, until we, we, we scream, I cannot, I cannot keep this law. And when you become convinced of that, by the way, then the gospel is beautiful. <laughs> Jesus came and kept the whole law for his people. He suffered the punishment due unto the sins of his people. And by grace, through faith, you'll be saved. Let us be sure that when we are dealing with tender lives, whether they're young tender lives or old tender lives, who, who need the gospel or need to be reminded of the gospel. Maybe it's someone who's never been saved. Maybe it's someone who has been saved, but as Paul describes to Timothy, has been taken captive by the devil to do his will. Make sure that we don't press our traditions upon them as a, as a way of, of seeing them come to Christ or seeing them return to Christ, recover to Christ. We must press the evangelical law. And when the gospel comes into our lives, you know what? We don't throw the law away. When the gospel comes into our lives, Paul says in 1 John 5 that for all who've been born again, that the commandments are not a burden. 
That we don't get put out when someone says, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. And you say, Oh dear God, show me, show me in Christ how to do that. You should not kill. Oh, show me. Show me how to love life and protect life and, and be pro-life as a Christian. You should not commit adultery. Oh, God, help my heart be clean. Help me be pro-marriage. First of all, pro-marriage, my marriage, and then pro-marriage to promote it and, and to live out so the people look at our lives and say, wow, look what the gospel does to two sinners who live under the same roof. You see? The evangelical look at the law, which Jesus would use and Paul would use, is obscured when we let tradition replace the law. So, this is Holy Week. Leading up next Sunday, Lord willing, till we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ as we do every Sunday here, but next Sunday, Easter Sunday, we celebrate it with all of the world of believers who rejoice that Jesus has risen from the grave. Let's use this week. If we lead up to celebrating the Lord's Supper on Easter Sunday, let's use this week to examine our hearts and ask ourselves when we have these thoughts and we, and we stop and say, oh, where does that come from? Or is, that, is that a tradition I grew up? I mean, this is silly. I believe growing up that the dis distribution of the quarterly, the Sunday school quarterly, which was given out how often? Quarterly, four times a year, that's why they called it that. That the distribution of the quarterly meant we were going to celebrate the Lord's Supper that Sunday. I always knew. If we got a new quarterly in Sunday school, Lord's Supper at church. Now, if I carried that with me and said, no, we only celebrate the Lord's Supper when we get new Sunday school material. That's a tradition that I would have superimposed upon people, a yoke and a burden. No. Be sure. Just take, take this week and test yourselves. Test your thoughts against the Scripture. And ask yourself, now, is that a biblical? Did that grow out of the Scripture? Is that something I just grew up, you know, that's one of those mama always told me and daddy always told me. And Well, if mama and daddy got it from the Word, amen. But if somebody told them, you know, you see what I'm talking about? Because Jesus speaks with a strong denunciation about those, and in this case, the Pharisees and the scribes, who would take their traditions, superimpose them upon the people, uh, impose them to themselves so that they could, they could proudly think they keep the law, impose them upon the people so the people have no hope, and swallow the commandments up so the, so the very purpose of the commandments to bring people to the end of themselves and cry out for mercy from the law keeper, Jesus Christ, that was lost to view. You will encounter somebody this week who is in bondage to sin, not saved. Perhaps someone who's been taken captive by the devil to do his will. What will you do? What will you say? They need the gospel. Not our Southern Baptist wrinkles. They need the gospel. May we give them the gospel. Let's pray.